America, the Winter Soldier. <laughs> Thanks, voiceover guy. Hey? <laughs> I was going to say, I think we might cut that guy out, but uh, yeah. oh, what the hell? <laughs> We've had a few voiceover guys on the show recently. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see that, that uh, trend's coming back. So, okay, so Captain America 2, The Winter Soldier. So this is, I guess, the second last film in Marvel's Phase 2 uh, operations. We've still got Guardians of the Galaxy before we go into the second Avengers film. Is that all? Is there only one? I believe so. I could be wrong, but I can't think of anything else on the horizon. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. Because yeah. they're waiting for Phase 3 to do the Hulk movie, so... Oh, I don't know. That. Don't know if that's actually happening. Maybe. Oh, actually, yeah, that's not even on the on the Ant-Man cards. Ant Man is, is the only one that they've got pegged for Phase Three at the moment. Yeah, right. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the first Captain America, we should touch on that briefly, just uh, to refresh our memory. What did you think of the first film? Uh, I really enjoyed it, and I actually rewatched it a couple of weeks ago, uh, just because I wanted a refresher. I, I think it's really fun. It was it was really really surprising because I went into it thinking that it was going to be this really kind of over the top, overly patriotic kind of. It's a really awkward, hard character to do, mm. and they did such a good job of, especially when they introduced the suit that he was this reluctant kind of um, propaganda tool. Yeah, he was yeah. this mascot for the army that he didn't really want to be, and that kind of explains why the costume looked kind of stupid at the beginning, and then they modified it a little bit, and yeah. the whole progression from the small nerdy guy, which looked great in CGI, to yep. uh, when he got all beefcaked up. It Just- was a genius bit of screenwriting to, to bring that character into being, and I was very dubious that they'd actually be able to pull that off. So, yeah, I totally agree. For me, the first two-thirds of that film are pretty amazing as far as uh, superhero films go and then it just falls into a big silly mess with the red skull and it does, yeah. a whole bunch of stuff with a tesseract or something i forget all these it's the tesseract yeah, it's the thing yeah. from um what they thor? used it in uh yeah thor or okay. was it in the avengers i think as it's because well? it's, it's in loki's stick is that the same yeah thing? that's right yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah. It, it's not red skull's fault i mean i really like that comic book <sighs> book portrayal yeah. of the the weird looking red skull Hugo Weaving guy yep. it was just that it, it just turned into one of these well now we've got 45 minutes let's just spend 75% of the CGI budget yeah, and yeah. blow things up I agree the red skull character wasn't the problem it was just everything else it was just a mess they had all these great story strands all these great characters that they'd developed really competently in the oh, first so part of the well, film such yeah. good characters yeah. and it just all sort of fell apart so that was a shame but because it, it was almost a very a brilliant film but it was just a pretty good film in the end yeah. but one of the better phase one Marvel films I'd say way better than Thor yes. um, way better than Iron Man 2 um, yes, yes. So, yeah. It's such a, such a hurdle to overcome as well is they managed to get a Captain America movie done in this day and age yes. that wasn't ridiculous. But what they, I think what the brilliant thing they did was instead of making a superhero film, they made a World War II period uh, war film. Yeah, sure. Which is, it was a good tactic. And in this film, uh, similarly, they've gone for what they are describing as a 70s conspiracy thriller. So what you've got now is you can't rely on the jokes they use in an Avenger about Cap not understanding the 21st century because he's been here long. Long enough now. He's done some research. He's caught up a little bit, so he can't be the fish out of water that he was in in the Avengers. Although it was very amusing. So this is a lot less Joss Whedon than than the Avengers. It's also a lot less Joss Whedon than even Thor. The, the second Thor movie was very heavy on the jokes, which was unexpected. Mm. But then again, Thor is a sillier character inherently, so you can get away with sort of poking fun at this. But Captain America, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, he's just a guy. I mean, he's a super soldier, but he doesn't have... He's not that outlandish, I guess. He's just a bit a bit of a roided up um, soldier. Yeah. And that's fine, really, because... And he's meant to be kind of naive, and he just wants to fight his fight for his country. Exactly. And, Very yeah. vanilla characterization, which is another problem they have to overcome. So, putting uh, sort of this good old boy in this situation where he's in a world where it's a lot more grey areas than it used to be. <laughs> the great thing about World War II, so black and white, so easy. Nazis bad, <laughs> allies good, everyone's fine with that. Like, no one's going to argue at that point. There's no, yeah, there's no room for... It's not like we're talking about Lone Survivor. It's not like yep. uh, there are these divided sides. People pretty much agree now. Yes. <laughs> on the way that that went down. <laughs> there was definitely one side was worse than the other. Yeah. So, uh... So he's coming into a world where it's espionage and there's cameras and, you know, drones and all this sort of stuff. And he has to try and find his place in it. But he's still got these very um, quaint 1940s values. And that obviously clashes with the world that he exists in now. But what I love about the way they kicked off this film is they had him obviously undertaken a lot of extensive uh, modern world training. So he's he's sort of ninjaed up. And they, they open the film with a pretty spectacular set piece where they uh, have a mission to reclaim a boat that's been taken over by 
terrorists. And it's a great operation. And he's just full of all these moves and he's using his shield in a real offensive fashion. It's like a boomerang now. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. And he's, it was, you know, and that was cool to see. But he's also struggling with who to trust and that sort of stuff. And of course, the, the crux of this film is he is betrayed by his government or by his agency and he goes on the run, essentially. And that's what most of the film is. And what did, did you think this 70s conspiracy thriller comparison is apt? Because I've got to say, I don't. No, I, I'm glad you don't either. Mm. For six months now, we've been hearing these directors towing this goddamn line about it's a, yeah, sure, it's a Marvel movie and it's a Captain America movie, but what we're really going for is a 70s thriller. We're it's going three for days of the three days of the condor. Yeah. That's right. All the president's men. <laughs> yeah. We're going for a real proper, proper thriller. And then we build the world around that. <laughs> And I just, I'm, I am really sick of hearing people talk about action movies and saying, well, yeah, it's about one man killing other people for three hours, but really what it is is about one man's search for a daughter. And it's just, you know, it's a load of crap. Yeah. So. I'm just trying to get my kids back. It's, but- this, this barely, this, in fact, no, this doesn't barely, this has no resemblance to a 70s thriller at all. All. Unfortunately not. It's way too glossy for one thing. And the other thing is, I mean, the crux of the thing, as I just mentioned, is it's about a, a, an agent essentially being hunted by his agency and doesn't know who to trust. And it's got lots of close quarter action fight scenes. This is a Bourne film. Yes, thank I mean, you. It's a Bourne With movie. some superhero elements, obviously, especially the last act, um, which does go down that traditional Marvel path of let's blow a lot of stuff up because yeah. we don't have much time left. But... Um, Oh, there are so many things in this that are Jason Bourne-esque, and I can't believe they didn't talk about that in the publicity. I mean, that would have been fine if you were going to mention that. I mean, it's not Maybe it's not, not cool taboo, anymore because it? Skyfall was all about that. The, the James Bond nah, revival wasn't. was... Casino Royale was. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Casino Royale. That yeah. was all about taking Bourne. Maybe they feel like that's a that's a party line that is too old to be towed anymore. <sighs> it's Oh, so 70s is fine. <laughs> well, well, no, but it's it's a different take. It's yeah, a, yeah. It's, but yeah, th- this doesn't... It doesn't seem to resemble any any of that. I mean, the basic premise, right, yep. is that Shield, which controls all the superheroes and all that, led by Nick Nick Fury, Samuel L. Jackson. So yeah, it's it's a, it's about him being betrayed mm-hmm. essentially, and that that isn't really a seventies thing at all, like like what you're saying. But it is. I mean, it, it, it is it is and it isn't. I mean, it does resemble Three Days of Condor of the Condor a little bit. Because of that, um, which is a similar similar idea about uh, an operative, not a fighter, but like a, a admin operative getting a bit screwed over by his government. But the the film doesn't feel like that at all. Like that plot point, yes, but that's about it. And that plot point obviously is a lot more comparable with a Jason Bourne film these days. Yeah, yeah. And it just feels so just gung ho, and there's a lot of action. It's, it feels like a Marvel film. Like it's not a bad thing. Any none of these things are bad. I'm just saying, doesn't feel like a '70s film. No, no. And so if you you ignore that and then just look at the movie on its own terms what it then what it does resemble is something is a movie that got far too mired down in its plot because to be honest i really didn't like this movie at all really yeah i really didn't like oh, it oh wow uh, oh, you did like it. Yeah, I did like it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I didn't realize you. you okay. No, I had, I had a really bad time with it because I, it felt like it was trying to be so much weightier than it could handle, and I was, I, I thought it was really dull for the most part. The stuff that I don't get about it is why it it brings up all these ideas. Like in the first ten minutes, we get the, this whole idea that um, uh, what Shield's trying to do to protect the world mm. isn't. Uh, what's that that line that um, he says? It's not. It's not um, freedom. This is fear. Yes. Um, and then so it tries to touch on this whole kind of uh, big brother kind of sense yes. and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Surveillance of the citizens, etc. Yeah, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. And then it just completely forgets about it. And then for the next two hours, and this is like a two hour, 20 minute movie or something. For the next two hours, it just it just goes through the motions of an incredibly stupid plot. So I can't I can't say things about the plot that I have huge problems with. <laughs> okay, okay. We will do a spoiler we section will. Will. Uh, after the credits. So we'll let the end music play out and then we'll talk for a while about sure. that kind of stuff. But I uh, there are I don't want to get into uh, what I didn't like about it until you at least say uh, what it what it was you did okay. enjoy about the movie. Fair so enough. Much. Fair enough. All right. I, I think basically I, I think we both just. We saw the same things, but just felt about them in different ways because I didn't feel it got bogged down in the plot that much at all. I felt the plot was lean enough that the action kept on moving and it you just it did get to the points that it needed to in the time it should take. And I, I'm just going to jump ahead now to the third act just briefly, just because 
this is the major problem with most of the Marvel films. When it gets to the third act and they just have the big fight off, it often just falls apart a little bit. It doesn't necessarily ruin the film, but it, it just makes you go, well, you've done all this stuff. You've had a couple of great set pieces and a great, great bit of characterization. You can't really top that. So they just sort of get jumbled. But I really, really liked this sort of showdown. And I think I felt this way similarly about uh, the new Thor film as well. I thought that showdown was pretty well handled. Although, in hindsight, that was way more chaotic than this one was. What I liked about this was it was just so clear what was going on. There were no crazy MacGuffins. I mean, there was they they all had these things I won't say what they are but they needed to get the things from A to B and that was it that was that was the mission at the end and they had separate people doing separate things and the the editing was was done in a way that you could follow what was going on the action was shot really um, you know fast paced and crazy but you always had the people in the frame you needed to see and I just thought it was refreshingly straightforward for for one of these big superhero films so I really thought the whole thing held together really well. Yeah? Yeah. I'm not saying... Okay, okay I think my expectations were super high as well because of all this bollocks about it being a 70s political thriller, which I was really looking forward to. I didn't really get that. So I was a bit let down for that reason, but I thought what the film ended up being, which was a very, very slick action film, I think it held together really, really well, and I enjoyed all the performances. So, okay. Yeah. For me, it just felt like they were... It would just... The movie would stop for 10 minutes, and they would talk about this really dumbass plot, which just felt like it was so conspired. I mean, we talk about Lars von Trier. You contri- contrived? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, contrived, yes. yes. But we're talking about Lars, Lars von Trier and how it feels like his characters are being pushed around and being made mm. to do things, and he is intentionally... He doesn't care about realism or logic or anything yep. like that. And I know that that doesn't apply to Marvel movies, but this just felt like one of those things where this happens and then this happens and then this happens. It didn't feel like a natural snowball effect where these events are occurring, so we need to do this to counteract this. It felt like a lot of scrambling to get to set pieces that didn't warrant being there. I'm having a really hard time not not spoiling, <laughs> uh, not yeah, not giving away the the big thing because that's that's I have a huge problem that I can only say in a spoiler section. Okay, we will get to that. But so beyond beyond the plot elements, which I thought was just it seemed to be aiming for so much higher than it than it was actually achieving, and it seemed convinced that it was up there the whole time with what it, it was trying to achieve. Look, I will concede it's- that the st- some of the stuff they were bringing up at the start, which are very big important issues, uh, as such as you know the surveillance thing, and so yeah, so the captain's stance is yeah, this is fear, um, we're controlling people, and Nick Fury says uh, the line is Shield lives in the world as it is, not as the world it should be or how we want it to be. That's sort of something. Like yeah, that. something. Yeah, yeah. The point is, uh, he's saying people have to do bad stuff in the shadows to make the world safe which yeah. is a yeah, great party line for anyone in the intelligence community if they ever have to defend why they spy on their own citizens they say well we have to because it keeps you safe that's right um, which is an interesting argument however they do kind of drop it at that point and they never really pick it up again I mean it yeah. is present throughout the entire film but I, I don't feel that they get to a satisfying conclusion about which side uh, ends up being correct I mean there is a bit at the end which um, I won't go into but it's very very similar to a scene in Skyfall. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Okay, we'll talk about that later then. I don't want to give too much away. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. So, I think some of the... Uh, uh, the, the point is, there's stuff in this film that is grander than, than what the film is, and they are taking it very seriously, but I guess I'm just grateful that that's there at all, even if it doesn't quite follow through to be... Uh, a really deep, dark adult film about these issues because it, it's, an, it's a superhero film at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and the fact fine. that it's got a bit of this invested in there just to, to make the DNA a little bit more interesting, I'm fine with that. And I was yeah. grateful that it was there at all. I think, yeah, that's a fair enough point. And I, I do, I guess I do appreciate in a sense them trying to do a story that is slightly more complicated. I mean, it's not a really dense story or anything, but it is, I guess, a little bit more complicated than your average Marvel movie that sometimes they can be pretty straightforward. Well, sometimes they're just complicated for but, the sake of being complicated, and they're just stupidly complicated. Like, Thor yeah. is a complicated... The, the second Thor is, is weird. Like, yeah, that's... But, I, yeah. but those characters like they don't make any sense the elves and all the stuff they're doing it, it's yeah. stupid it's complicated because it doesn't make sense this is complicated but if you just think about it for a moment you go oh, okay i get it you, you understand which team wants to do what and why i yeah i don't agree i don't okay. agree exactly with the okay. the character motivations in this movie i don't agree with at all and don't make sense to me at all all right but we'll- then the other reasons why i don't think the plot works very well is because 
they seem to keep solving they they get to a, a crossroads and the way they're going to overcome a problem is so ridiculous and just arbitrary and i i was got so sick in the first half hour of people decrypting encrypted information and talking there's this this through line throughout the entire movie of this this bunkum kind of technology stuff that no one really knows apparently everyone is a super hacker that knows stuff about this seems like a movie that was made before computers even existed because they're dealing with these encrypted files and all they need to do to unencrypt them is say un unencrypt and then the computer goes unencrypting oh failed couldn't do it uh oh and then they try they type in some other shit and then it's just other, for some reason the technology aspect of this movie really really bugged me and okay. it comes up Time and time again, it was. It felt like eight or nine times we had to watch people in front of futuristic computers type in stuff or reference radio signals and different um, different control mechanisms. All this just hokum crap. I'm really not recalling much of this at all, but we. I guess we'll talk but, more specifically about it in spoilers. But well, uh, it's not. No, it's not really spoilers at all. Okay. It's just. That it seemed. It seemed to me that they just invent this thing. They go, well, there's a, there's a piece of information over here that we need to get, yeah. and so if our good guy is to get it, what could stop him? Go, oh well, we'll just encrypt it. The bad guys encrypted it. Yep. How could someone get that information? Well, he could unencrypt it <laughs> or decrypt it. It's, or, sorry, <laughs> decrypt it. Yeah, whatever the fuck. I it's it, it's so it, that kind of stuff really really irritated me okay other stuff that i didn't like was <laughs> falcon yeah i was totally on board throughout the whole promo stuff this is um what's his name? anthony mackie yeah anthony i mackie. love that guy he's so good in um the adjustment bureau he's uh you know he's one of the hat guys i assumed yeah <laughs> uh He's so he the whole deal with him having wings and just because they had a off the cuff conversation of, Oh, you seem like a nice guy, you wanna come help us? He goes, Oh yeah, sure. Oh, by the way, I got some wings. He goes, Oh, that's cool. Just fly him around. <laughs> yeah, I guess that was a bit convenient. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> and I know I, I know that there's meant to be an element of ridiculousness. I will say I love all three Iron Man movies. Yeah. I did really enjoy the first Captain America movie. I did I did actually genuinely like Iron Man too. Thor, Thor movies, not so much. So I, I am on board for this kind of ridiculousness. Mm. If it is consistent and makes sense, this just constantly felt like a kid's story where he's just jumping in going, and then he had wings, and yeah, then I, he could fly. I kind of assume there'd be a scene where he gets given the wings, and, and some, the, the captain has some way of, of going here. Here's this technology, but he already had it. Coincidentally, they just ran into each other, it's and then a, he starts using them yeah, later. Now, now you mention it; it's a bit, uh, a bit easy. It's a blink and you miss it kind of origin story. Yes, yeah, pretty much. Oh, I've got some wings. Yeah. Was, oh, cool, great. Okay, that's great. <laughs> we'll the, call uh, you Falcon because it says that on the on the uh, Manila folder here. That's right. Conveniently, it sounds like a superhero's name. Yeah. The other thing that I was really mm. disappointed in was all the imagery for the Winter Soldier himself. The Man, bad I thought guy the Winter himself. Soldier was badass. Me too. Oh. Well, I thought he was in the promos. <laughs> and you... he was, and he was to a point in the movie, he but the way, they, the way they treated him, though, was kind of like what they did with um, Whiplash in Iron Man 2, is you get three, basically you just get three scenes with no, him. Oh, he was more prevalent when, than, than Whiplash was. Uh, ma it was marginally. heaps of scenes, and he was so exciting and all Not of them. heaps of, Towards the end, maybe. Does that he, matter? <laughs> heaps what, and heaps. what I didn't what I didn't like about it was the way that he there didn't really seem to be any importance with that guy until they felt like they should then make him important enough. Uh, this is a, another thing, another spoiler thing. We're going to have to wait, but I didn't like the the sort of like just off the cuff kind of treatment of the Winter Soldier. I would have appreciated more time invested in that story rather than watching people decrypt data. Yeah, okay, so I think the problem with the Winter Soldier is he's a bit of a brainwashed character that is a tool of a, a government or a particular regime. So he doesn't have much say in what's right or wrong. He just gets an order and then does the order, right? Which is, you know, is an issue because it's hard to really care about a character like that that's so programmed. So yeah. is, that, is that, I mean, that's well, just the nature the of the beast, isn't it, with these sort of characters? Yes, in a, in a way, yeah. Yeah, but you, you do want the badass guy to be in total control. You mm. want him to be the leader. Not, okay. not the pawn. I, no, underst but, yeah. I understand that the the pawn part of the story is, I guess, an, an an interesting element. It just it felt it for me. 
we'll have to talk about I it in spoilers, I- but it, it felt like a missed opportunity. Yeah. But the first time that the Winter Soldier was on screen, that was by far the most interesting part of the movie for me, hands down. I think that's fair enough, because I, I think I would have liked him more if he had a bit more of a consciousness, because he, he does seem so in control when he's in his action scenes. Mm. And it is he's very dangerous, and he feels like a perfect match for Captain America. Mm. And plus, he just looks goddamn awesome. He looks so cool. Yeah. yeah. It's very simple, very a great costume design, like, and his weaponry and, and whatnot. He just looks damn cool kind of like a Mortal Kombat kind of mask oh, thing going God's on a, yes and the and the arm like Jax yeah, yeah exactly yeah he's yeah. like an amalgamation of like Scorpion yeah and, um, nice and one yeah anyway <laughs> can I keep on going about things I didn't like bring it on I'm, I'm enjoying this <laughs> this goddamn convenient bullet syndrome thing that happens in action movies where there's guns and bullets flying around the place yeah Millions and millions of bullets. They only ever hit where they need to when they should. There is an incredibly you, you, you irritating could, another decrypting or another computer information entering, like data, this is data entry, Captain America data entry situation where this guy is trying to type something into a computer, but they don't want him to. So all of a sudden, everyone in the room starts shooting each other up, and he manages to stand in the middle of the room and just type before running away and getting unhurt. It's it's. It just, yeah, but that's because all the people that were trying to shoot him were, were dead. They had, yeah, but you watch the way that it's edited and there is, he's standing in the middle of a gunfight for a good two or three seconds and it's fine. He's just, oh, he looks over his shoulder. Oh, I better type a little bit faster. It's just, it's it's stuff like that. I mean, that's just one scene. There are plenty but of scenes where- that is action the, movies in general though. It I mean, doesn't you have can't to, throw it all out did, the, no, with the bathwater. No, this has never, this has never really been a Marvel thing though. They have generally made action more interesting out of just people throwing bullets around. Mm, yeah, I guess, but that, that's, I guess that's a problem with Captain America being who he is and being this part of the Marvel Universe that needs to have people firing guns at him to be a threat. Yeah. Because you can't have people throwing, I don't know, lightning Look, at him. I, I know it's a complaint that you can make about almost every action movie, yeah. but I I was so downtrodden with this about 45 minutes into it that Damn. when they're just throwing bullets around like that, I was just bored because there's no it doesn't matter because you know the bullets are only going to hit where they want them to hit when they want them to hit <laughs> i guess i wasn't i mean it's just sort of um f- filler i guess i mean you, you yes have, and that's not a good thing well aren't we at a point now where we're just kind of used to it i mean unless if you're saying we're at a point now where we uh, want and need filler and that's a good thing that's maybe a not, bad maybe thing maybe not filler but like accompaniment i mean when there's a, a gun battle going on in the background it is going on in the background you, you're not really that concerned about the hero getting hit by a stray bullet because it's never going to happen yeah until the you know the two the antagonists and protagonists are facing off then there might be some bullets flying that yeah. Ma- might mean something but otherwise it is literally every other action movie people fire guns and miss all the time yeah I do yeah I agree with that <laughs> there, there is a scene in this towards the beginning when Nick Fury is in one of the most amazing cars known to man and that is when you feel like the bullets actually have some kind of an impact yeah. because you you can tell what he is fighting against and the way that he yes. gets out of it is pretty interesting yeah like that that whole sequence is really really quite fantastic we've never seen him Nick Fury in a situation like that he doesn't like have that. much yeah he doesn't have many uh, hero moments in, in these series of films he's mostly be consigned to admin roles essentially that's right yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, every now he ha- has a bit of a kick ass moment in the Avengers if I remember correctly but I mean this is a bit more uh, Fury centric for this this amazing car chase sequence I really liked that whole bit it was yeah it was yeah. It was interesting. I mean, it, it's kind of ridiculous. Where does he get this car from? But if he's in S.H.I.E.L.D., then they can have whatever well, they want, they have, I guess. They have flying um, uh, aircraft carriers, Dave. Yes. So I think having a, a smart car is not that bit, much oh, of a stretch of the imagination. It was beyond a smart car. It was almost like a Transformer kind of car. Heli carriers, but, Dave. Yeah, I know. Heli carriers. Yeah, see, see, that's that's the problem with this movie is I don't understand, like, where do you draw the line? Do you draw a line at all? <laughs> what? What's what, you draw the line? Heli carriers, obviously. I mean, that's that's their their prime mode of uh, that's their crowning achievement of, of shield. I mean, yeah, they have- I, I guess what I'm getting at is if if they yeah yeah okay, so they've got the heli carrier thing, and they've yeah. got this this jeep that is like a combination between Arnold Schwarzenegger and a transformer. Then why is I guess I just it just feels randomly inserted. This is your problem with the the rules of the universe. You want it all laid out about <laughs> limitations again. <laughs> no, I just I want it to make more sense than just this. This feels like they just 
kept plonking in things they thought would be cool. Like there's there's a, <laughs> and it was cool. <laughs> nah, there's a there's a gadget. And that, God um, said it will be cool, and it was. <laughs> there's a gadget. A gadget. <laughs> Speaking of God, there's a there's a gadget that Black Widow uses to transform her appearance. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that that is, that's really, very Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible E, isn't it? That really bugged me again because it's just a. We need her to do something and get in somewhere, so what? the only way she could do is, is this, so we'll just make it that. It felt very arbitrary. Yeah, I was a bit let down by that to reveal as well. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, there are moments where it's like, well, we need to get to this point, so let's make a gadget do it. It's, it's like in fantasy yeah, where yeah. they go, a wizard did it, you know, it's fine. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> and I, I guess I've come to expect more, especially after Iron Man 3. I uh-huh. just love that to did death. Did you like the film, Dave? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. And I, I'm I'm aware of what I'm saying, too, because people did not take kindly to us not liking Thor 2. So, mm, I'm really, true. um yeah, I'm not doing us any favours by ragging on this, but I just I couldn't get behind it. I have an issue with uh, the Peggy, Peggy Carter character. Um, old Peggy Carter? Old Peggy Carter, yeah. Damn old Peggy Carter. Damn her. How can, how can um, you have a problem with an old lady? Because... All she was doing was lying in a bed. In the first Captain America, she was... You know, fantastic. She was the female lead yeah. and the love interest for Captain America. And when he gets frozen at the very end, this isn't a huge spoiler because he's obviously in the real world now, in the 20th, 21st century now. He had a date with her and he runs out and he, he's in modern day New York and he and someone says, what's up? Are you, are you lost or whatever? And they tell him what era he's in. All of a sudden, Nick Fury's in the middle of Times Square. Yeah, and exactly, it's one of, exactly. When you watch it analytically, it makes no <laughs> sense, but it looks so good. Yeah, it does. But then his line, I had a date. It was so heartbreaking. And and I, I took it at that time to mean that Peggy Carter had died. He's that far ahead in the future that she's dead. But she's not dead, obviously. She's in a nursing home. But... He's missed a life with her and he's missed that connection. And it's really quite touching and beautiful. It's the sort of thing you can only do in time travel fiction. Uh, and it's a real fantastic par- um, paradox and it's beautiful. And I love that relationship that is lost. And bringing her back as an old woman, I mean, she's an adult in the in World War Two. Why is she still alive? And I mean, she's, you know, obviously near death, but she's still in a, in a nursing home, just chilling out, just uh, completely coherent. Well, I guess she'd be in, yeah, she'd be, or because she seemed to be, I guess, in her early 20s in the first Captain America. I know oh, she looks like she's 30, but yeah. they probably meant her to be in her early 20s. But she's in the army, like she's a high-ranking military officer. Yes, that's true. You know? Yeah, so she would be pushing 100. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but yeah. my point is that when Cap says in the first film, I had a date. Like, that moment is so touching, and I think that should be the end of their relationship. I mean, he's lost it. The fact that he still can hang out with her and, and talk, and they can have a friendship, it's like, that's just a cop-out. Yeah. I mean, she should be dead, is what I'm saying. I don't want to be too cold-hearted, but honestly, <laughs> she should be in the ground. That old lady, she should be dead, <laughs> yeah, goddammit. I, I hate that old lady. <laughs> yeah. So No, actually, that is, now that, you put it like that, that does make, uh, it doesn't make much sense. It's, it just feels to, to cheapen the amazing impact of the first film. Yeah. And also, her scene in this film as an old lady is so pointless and redundant yep. I mean, it, it adds nothing to the story that's it just right, gives yeah. him a chance to muse a bit about the nature of shit and that's that, it's just pointless so they could have kept a lot of weight from the original movie if they yeah. didn't have her yeah I didn't actually I'd think about that have him going to her graveside that'd be great at least you're carrying on that pain that you've introduced in the first film having her yeah. alive is just dumb yes anyway absolutely uh, nearly need to get into spoilers uh, I guess I could say this before getting into spoilers they do Several things with Nick Fury's character that I just thought was absolute crap. Can't go into that much further. <laughs> and uh, Robert Redford. I, oh, we should talk about Redford a little bit, yes. I, what a vanilla kind of guy. I mean, I got absolutely no sense of anything from him in this movie at all. And it's so weird after seeing him display a, a wide range of emotion in hmm. All Is Lost, which I didn't particularly like, but he was uh, pretty damn incredible in. I, he just... This felt like it could have been Harrison Ford sleepwalking his way through the role. I disagree. I think he's got a lot of charisma. Yeah? I mean, I, I, I always wait, wait, like In this Redford. movie? Yeah, in this movie. Oh, okay. Uh, he seems to be the most relaxed I've seen him in a long time. In the last couple of films I've seen see, him in. Yeah, that's for sure. And I think that, that suits the character. I mean, the last couple of films, obviously, all is lost. And the one before that, the really misjudged spy thriller... Oh, which Spy is Game? Called, with Brad no, Pitt? No, that, that was good. That was like 10 years no. ago. Um, 
like maybe it's not good, but it's you know it's serviceable. But yeah. the, the one quite recently where he's on the run, um, sort of like an old Bourne film, <laughs> <laughs> old Jason. I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, it was rubbish. Yeah, I, I can and see. And it the was disappointing. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. he might have had a hand in producing. Anyway, the point is, in this film, he's so relaxed and just fun. He he knows that he's in a superhero film, which has never been anywhere close to a superhero film before, and he's just really enjoying having the gravitas of being Robert fucking Redford and just going. Hey, I'm Robert Redford, and I'm going to be like, hey, delivering lines over here and doing a bit of a sly nod here. And he's mm. just having a really good time. And he just, he sort of commands the room every time he's in a scene, which is exactly what that character should be doing. And I thought he brought just the right amount of charm to it. I, I really liked him in this film. Yeah. So I have to disagree with you on that one. All right, fair enough. I mean, I. It's starting to feel like we saw a different, a different yeah, movie. Is, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, before we do jump into spoilers at the end, I did want to just uh, touch, uh, just, just just throw out uh, really the end credit sequence, which I thought was amazing. Did you, uh, I mean, you you're mean probably this- too jaded by this point, but the actual, <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking about like the mid credits scene or the post credit scene. I just mean the actual end credits, the, the Saul Bass title design they used, the, uh, oh, the thing- black and white um, images and stuff. I mean, it's just a really simplistic sort of way of representing presenting each character but uh, and, the, and it's got a great I guess uh, 70s sort of um, soundtrack going on there I think he's listening to they mentioned the artist it's Marvin Gaye he's Marvin Gaye isn't he yeah, yeah they, they are really trying to make some 70s illusions throughout yeah, the whole movie yeah it doesn't really work it doesn't know but uh, I love that the end titles I thought they were really just quite amazing and that's just something and that's great because you've got Marvel films and everyone knows that there's going to be something at the end of the credits. So it's one of the only kind of films that a modern audience, especially a young audience, is actually going to sit in the cinema and watch the end titles. Usually mm-hmm. everyone gets up and leaves. So obviously the the Marvel Studios feel um, an obligation to make those end titles interesting. Because I remember the uh, Thor 2 titles were interesting too. But anyway, these were just beautiful. Really, really fantastically Yeah, made, they were nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm happy to leave that and we'll go into spoilers after the... double the stingers. Things. I don't want to say what they were, but... I just thought they were both a massive waste of time. I thought the the mid credit stinger was amazing. Oh yeah, and the second okay. one was rubbish. Oh, actually, sorry. No, that's that's right. I'm being a little bit harsh. The yes. the first one was it was interesting. Mm. The last one was near nearly completely actually no completely redundant. I I said to your dad it should have been the other way around because it should have been the pointless one in the mid credits and then you wait all that time to get the gold one. You that's know? a good point. Yeah. Like why didn't they do that? Because we it was it's like a, a, slap it's a in the long face. long wait <laughs> yeah. to. Oh, did you notice Film Victoria? Produced, no. um, they had something to do. Some of the visual effects were done here in Melbourne. Oh, that's cool. There's a few FX houses here. That makes sense. With the sponsorship of Film Victoria, which I guess so is. Does that mean giving... our tax dollars went to making this film? Yeah, yeah. All oh, right. Well, there's, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a good way of looking at it, but then there's also. I... Wouldn't it be nicer to see, see Film Victoria put its money towards uh, independent filmmakers rather than giving it to a digital production house to pay for effects in a billion dollar blockbuster digital production artists uh, filmmakers too and you know we're still paying for Australian filmmakers yeah, to make movies I, look, I, I won't pretend to understand the industry but I don't quite get why the government needs to be subsidising a production house that's doing a Hollywood film it do- that doesn't quite make sense to me because uh, well, I think it's 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 and they're it's, funding jobs. I know they're funding local jobs. I think that's where the, the the buck stops, Dave. I think that's that's the reason they are doing it. They're still funding Australian jobs, and they're keeping um, the lucrative Hollywood movies in this country, which is a huge deal. I mean, you have to fight for that. I mean, there's so many places in the world now where a Hollywood film can shoot for very cheap and for tax breaks and things like that. So filming in Australia is not always ideal. So if there's any way that they can make it a little bit easier for Hollywood studios to come here and make films, I think it's only a good thing. I, yes, yes, I, I guess so. But Film Victoria are notor- they're notorious for uh, n- not spreading their money around uh, very... I mean, we had, what was it, Richard Wollstonecroft from mm-hmm. um, Melbourne Underground Film Festival and is also a director was saying that there's no way that he could get any money from them to film anything here for any kind of production. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of politics so, uh, when it comes to, yeah, independent products and stuff like that. That's true. I'm not saying that they're the, uh, you know, the guardians of, of Australian film. I'm just saying it's, it's keeping it. jobs in locally and that's only a good yeah, thing. Yeah, I get it. It's kind of akin to how the government had to fund 
SPC's factory so that they could keep on <laughs> keep on producing even though SPC is owned by Coca-Cola. Yeah. So it's this kind of it's a weird it doesn't gel particularly well with me, but I okay. understand that they are li- literally putting food on the table for some families here in yep. Melbourne, so Yep. I just, I just thought it was interesting. <laughs> that sounds like an entirely another podcast we could do on that issue. <laughs> <tape. laughs> I, I never knew that um, that there were digital warehouses here uh, working alongside Marvel. I had no idea. Did you hear? Speaking of that, did you hear about the Mar- um, the Marvel, the effects company that did all the effects for Noah, um, uh, like almost out of business? Really, it's yeah. like Life of Pi all it's over not, again. It's not like that d- exactly. It's more the fact that they sort of took on more work than they could handle and they ended up covering a lot of the costs on their own. So they are just in a, a huge amount of debt. They delivered the product, which is what Darren Ofsky, um asked for, or the studio demanded of them. But at the end of the day, they just said that they could handle it when they couldn't. So they're actually, um, they're not out of business, but they're very, very much in the red. Right. Um, which is just, yeah, it's, it, it seems to be a, a continuing problem with the FX industry. There's just not enough people paying them what they are worth. And it's, yeah, yeah. it seems to be an ongoing problem. It's, it's amazing too, because they, they're such an integral part of movies these days. Oh, and amazing. these movies have such huge budgets that it seems I know. bizarre that they're not getting paid enough. Why do they cut corners when it comes to, it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, yeah they're definitely, yeah, they're the new, you know, set designers from the uh, from the old Hollywood system. I mean, they are. Mm. Yeah, you can't do it f- anyway. Uh, once again, another topic for another day. Shall <laughs> sure. we wrap this up before we move into spoilers? Uh, yeah. Any final notes? Uh, no. Well, we normally do a Blu-ray <laughs> spiel. Um, yep, as we said earlier, we don't have the notes There's here. There's some Blu-rays coming out next week. Guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also out this week is the Lego Movie, which we will endeavour to see and talk about next week. Yep. But next week's show is going to be equally as big. We'll be talking about Grand Budapest Hotel as well as the Lego movie. And then Muppets Most Wanted is also out. I don't know if we're going to get a chance to see that. But, Maybe not, uh, but we'll definitely do Grand Budapest as the feature review. And of course, we'll also touch on Lego movie for uh, mostly for our Australian listeners who haven't seen it yet because everyone else seems to have seen it. They got it years ago. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I believe like, it was nominated at like, ago, yeah, yeah. 2009 Oscars <laughs> yeah. or something like that. So if you'd like to let us know what you thought of any of the movies that we've talked about today... Captain America, anything else, Nymphomaniac, all that sort of stuff, you can tweet us. I'm at SS Snobs. Tom is at Snobs Podcast. You can email us at podcast at silverscreensnobs.com and find all of our episodes on the brand spanking new website at silverscreensnobs.com. Looks very good, Dave. You've done some fine work this week. Cheers. We're moving up in the world. <laughs> We're moving up in the world. All right. Uh, stay tuned for spoilers. Right, so you had a problem with the uh, the whole Hydra thing, I take it. Yeah. What's what's up? I just don't buy it for what's, a second. What's your beef? Am I meant to believe that Shield, one of the world's most organized, uh, they've got the best cars, they got the best helipads, they know what's going on. Yeah. Somehow they were being run secretly by Hydra. No, not being run, but no. Hydra was infesting their company for, what, 60, 70 years? They've been there since World War II? Yes. I wasn't quite sure of the timeline. Yeah, no, I think that was the, that was the idea, since World War II. Bullshit. Well, it's a comic book film, and <laughs> yes. I'm happy to take that leap of logic that there was... I mean, you've got first of all, you've got to um, buy that there is a secret intelligence agency that is better equipped than the CIA, the FBI, the NSA combined, and they have ridiculous amounts of uh, otherworldly technology at their disposal. Yet they so, can be infiltrated by a bunch of backwards Nazis. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, you, if you buy that, I mean, that that's one leap of faith, and then the idea that within that organization, there are some... Some people that are that have different agendas and they are you know linked by a network. I think that's fine. I I, I, bought, I bought it. No. Nah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's the level of discourse. <laughs> <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> I just I I just can't. Yeah, I I had this this argument in the car on the way home with yeah. with um other people that we saw the movie with and. 
they were pretty down on the idea that I was down on the movie. And <laughs> I'm, I am... It's going to be interesting to see if I am going to be uh, the lone the, the lone opposer of this movie. And I kept being told that I need to lighten up. It's a, it's a Marvel movie. And I, I... Yes, I know. I know how these... I'm, I'm aware of the superhero movie conventions. I'm aware of all that. It's just that there are... I guess maybe I would have believed it more if the actors portraying it seemed to believe it more. This all just felt like pawns being pushed around a board and just go, oh, hey, by the way, it was Hydra the whole time. It was Hydra. Well, in a sense, they are pawns, and I, I guess I'm okay with that because that's the plot. I mean, once once again, it, it's the Bourne uh, effect, and they are just trying to figure out who's in charge and who to trust and who they need to take down. Um, and I really liked the characters. I mean, I, I, it's good to see Black Widow being expanded a l- little bit more as a character um, and her relationship with St- Steve Rogers as well. You know, I mean, I, I just love Scarlett Johansson, and not just because she's a blindingly attractive woman. The fact is she... I've said this nearly every time she's popped up in a film we reviewed. I've said it about her. said it about that Hitchcock film, Hitchcock. She's a movie star. She just has that quality of, of being a genuine movie star. I don't know what it is, but she is just... You're drawn to her when she's on screen, and she's got a very sexy way of talking. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's just awesome. And um, yeah. I, I really like her in this very physical role of being this ass-kicking warrior, even though... That seems to be quite toned down in this. Apart from the assault on the ship and the shit later where she's actually a middle-aged woman, um, there's not actually a lot of action sequences with her in it. But anyway. Um, yeah. I just... I, I've never liked her as black. I, I I think that she's... Yeah, she's a great actress and a genuine star. Yeah. I've never liked her as Black Widow for Why some not? reason. It's for, I don't know. I think... It's hard for me to put a finger on. At times, I think that she, I, she feels just like a walking, uh, a walking set of boobs that's just stumbled into what is pretty much a man's world. And I'm not saying that that's my point of view. Mm. I feel that that's sometimes how the Marvel universe is portrayed. I mean, it's not. There's no real room for women in this universe. I just don't. I I guess she's got a little bit too. She's too snarky for me. She's got. A, she's a little bit too quippy. I don't like that kind of. It always goes overboard uh, for me, like the Joss Whedon kind of stuff, mm-hmm. where characters are made up almost entirely of um, snappy dialogue. I know you really like the new uh, series of The Simpsons, but. For every for when that started to go downhill around season ten or eleven, that was I like because... the old series more though. Let's be clear. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, no, of course, of <laughs> yeah. course. Yeah, but the reason I stopped watching it was because it felt like every single time a character opened their mouth, it had to have about three or four different jokes in a sentence. It felt like it was all so crammed in that there was no room for natural characters to just breathe and talk. And I feel that that's kind of what she is. She's she only exists to make snappy remarks. And they even some characters even say in the movie to. Where, you know, you you're not going to get away with this by just making you know a quippy kind of uh, remark. I can't remember the exact uh, okay, point I, where that I, happened. I don't but- remember that, but I mean, I, I feel that that's her character because she's putting up a front. Um, she doesn't have uh, a lot of the the things to fall back on that the men around her do. So she needs to have some sort of persona. And at one yeah. point, she breaks down. Oh, it doesn't break down, but she says to to Steve Rogers, you know, I only pretend to know everything because he's. He's uh, questioning her about all this, this, that, and the other, trying to figure out exactly where she stands in the whole thing, and she has to calm down and say, "Look, um, you know, I, I probably know about as much as you." I think a little bit more of that would have helped me. That okay. was a step down the right, down the right road, but it, it's not enough. I mean, they've been talking about making a movie, uh, a Black Widow movie, to explore either her origins or yep. to get like more a into the one. character. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh no, no one's really sure, but okay. Scarlett Johansson has said that she'd be definitely up for one, and I'm sure that they they would if they could and they might do in the next five or six years but I I would like to see it she doesn't feel uh, like a well-rounded character to me well maybe she needs her own film to to flesh her out a little bit more yeah Um, the bit that I was referring to from Skyfall earlier was the bit where she addresses the um the committee at the end, uh, the the Senate hearing, which is exactly the same fucking speech as Judy Dench gives to the Senate hearing in Skyfall, where she has to justify why the security forces exist to operate in the shadows. Oh, that's right. It yeah. was the same damn speech. It was really weird. Like, I mean, obviously it was necessary to finish the film on that note. There needed to be some reinforcement. Otherwise, wh- why would uh, anything like S.H.I.E.L.D. be necessary? So I understood why I was there, but it was just very strange how similar it was to a film that had only just recently come out. So yeah. I thought that was a bit odd, but anyway. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so Buck, what's his name? Buck Rogers? Bucky, Bucky? Uh, no. Bucky um, Larson. Bucky. Bucky. Yeah. Bucky. Buckster. Yeah, the, the Buckster. Oh, Buck. 
So that, so yeah, I'm not sure what to make of this. Are we meant to know? Here's the, the history with with me and the Winter Soldier thing. Yep. In the last six months, was I think maybe in Empire Magazine or Total Film, something like that. They do, did one of those um, on the set reports, yeah. And they showed a picture of the Winter Soldier, yeah. And the caption to it said Sebastian Stan as the Winter Soldier. So Sebastian yeah, yeah, Stan yeah. is Bucky, is the friend that supposedly died in the first movie. Yep. And rewatching the first movie a few weeks ago, it does become abundantly clear that the body was never found, yeah. and they brush over it very quickly for what was an they integral do. Do. role in the movie. So it is kind of clear, if you think about it a little bit, when you're watching the first Captain America, that Bucky is probably going to be coming back. Yeah, and I haven't read a lot of Marvel comics either, but I remember reading a, a film magazine, might have been one of those, and it very clearly stated, like, long before The Winter Soldier was going to come out, they were just they just sort of said about The Winter Soldier, they're like, oh, and so Bucky Larson, obviously Captain America's old friend from the World War II, is The Winter Soldier. They just, they just right. say it, like it's a fact, because all the comic pe- people know that that's what happens. It's a very p- apparently famous storyline in Captain America. So it was none of this kind of Star Trek Into Darkness, Benedict Cumberbatch exactly, is that sort of thing. an I mean, unknown villain. Yeah, it's, it's weird because, I mean, it's, it's like a, a DC fan not knowing who the next Robin is. I mean, it's just one of those things that, that, that comic fans know, but I was amazed how long they held that back in the film uh, as, as, a, as yes. a reveal because I thought it was pretty, even if you didn't know, I thought it was kind of obvious. You know those guys that were talking throughout the entire screening? Oh, yeah. They, when it was revealed it was Bucky, they both went, oh! That was weird, yeah. And I was surprised to hear people be, yeah, be amazed by that because... Uh, Maybe maybe it was not as obvious as I thought then. Well, as far as I was aware, over the last six months, it's been, basically, it's just been public knowledge that that is his new enemy was his best friend. But then... Now, now that I think about it, in the last few weeks, it has been kept a little bit more quiet. They've been trying to make it more mysterious. Who yeah. is this Winter Soldier? But then also, when you're watching the movie, it does kind of become clear. I mean, if you even vaguely remember yeah, the first, yeah, yeah. that it is him. And so, the fact that they have flashbacks to him as just Sebastian Shaw, the actor, yeah. uh, when they're back in World War II, is like, why are we seeing this? Oh, I wonder yeah. if it's foreshadowing something. That's right, yeah. it's <laughs> It was really weird, so I can't... Uh, and about yeah. his brainwash nature as well, I guess... I, I assume I didn't think he'd be brainwashed. I mean, I assume that that's what would happen to him at the start. He would have been picked up by the Soviets and brainwashed into a Soviet agent, which I think is the comic book origin. But I thought he would have still had an idea of what he was before. The fact that he was just a blank slate was a bit boring. Yeah. And he had to... It was obvious that um, Steve was eventually going to get through to him on some level by looking in his eyes really sincerely. So predictable. Which happens all the time. So that was a bit of a cop-out just because it was something we'd seen so many times before. And I was sort of waiting for that moment. And I just saw it in Robocop. Yeah, exactly. It would have been better if... He had uh, known exactly who Steve Rogers was, but he'd been conditioned to hate America or something. That would have been interesting. Anyway. That's true. What are you going to do? They would, Yeah, there could have been a lot more to do with that. And at the end, when Captain America is is drowning in the water, which, by the way, I didn't understand because in the beginning, he jumps out of a plane and he just goes straight into the water, lands in there, and he comes back up and he's fine. Was he drowning in the water? Well, he was sinking and he needed a hand up. I think he him. was just... Uh, defeated because I mean, when he when he decided to stay on the heli character <laughs> heli carrier when it was being bombed he was doing that to die he was like I yes I, I I'm I'm you know I'm gonna give up I'm gonna be with Bucky if he doesn't want to be my friend anymore I'm gonna take my ball and go into the afterlife and when <laughs> that was all over I think he was just defeated so that was I don't think he was actually in any trouble I think he was just like oh, I better I better get up I guess. No, no, he what, was... What happened to him in the water? I, I can't remember. Well, there, there was a... Wasn't it alluded to that... Um, oh, Bucky saved that him. Bucky saved him out of the water. Maybe he just... I don't... I so don't maybe know. maybe Captain America was so beaten up, yeah. either physically or morally... He shut that down. ...that he could not get himself out of the yeah, water this time. I, fair enough. I didn't think but about that. But it was... But he, had, he, you could he see threw that, a pretty big fight, you know. Yeah, sure. You could see that coming a mile away, though, that that hand would appear and everything yeah. would be all right. I what annoyed me about... Once again, the, the Bucky thing is the fact that he, um, he's been brainwashed. So all he knows is his, uh, you know, captors that have raised him to be this Russian fighter, which now, he wasn't really Russian at all, was he? Oh, no, he was. He spoke Russian at one point. Bucky? Yeah. Did he? Yeah. To the to the Russian guys, to the mercenaries. I mean, he was a Hydra operative. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. But, you know, he, he's supposed to be a Soviet-looking character. He's supposed to be a Russian guy. Yeah, okay. And he speaks Russian at one point. But then, obviously, he speaks to the Cap in his normal American accent. So, why would he even have an American accent if he's been ro- raised in Soviet Russia? Because that's why Black Widow knows who he is. Because she's a, a former Russian agent. Oh, uh, yes. 
So why would he speak like an American if he's never, in his mind, he's never heard an American uh, voice? He's always been raised by the Russian. You know, it just didn't make any sense that he yeah. wasn't a Russian-sounding character. He should have been. Yeah. That would have been interesting. Anyway. I don't know. I'm nitpicking now. Another thing I had a problem with, um, and this is just very specific, I couldn't talk about this in the main review, but there was a bit where Captain America gets on the PA to tell all the um, S.H.I.E.L.D. agents that um, you know shit's gone bad and Hydra's infiltrated everyone. He's basically telling thousands of people armed with guns to suspect their neighbour. Like, he doesn't say who the Hydra people are because he doesn't really know. He's just like, hey, guys, by the way, everyone's a suspect. So... Just good luck with that. And then people start killing each other. Like, that would have... It's the dumbest thing to do. Like, as soon as the Hydra guys know they're in trouble, they just start shooting. And these civilians just getting mown down. Like, poor office people going, oh, I have no stake in this in this fight at all, but I'm dead now. And what did Thanks, he say at the beginning? fucking Steve Rogers. This isn't freedom. This is fear. <laughs> yeah. It's the stupidest plan ever. It's not... Ah. None of it makes much sense but at the, all. Honestly, I, I'm, that is a, a nitpicking moment for me, but it didn't derail anything for me i was still fine with the general plot like the whole hydra thing and the fact hydra's mission i thought was pretty um pretty well thought out i mean i liked you know as far as super villain plans go that yeah if you buy the fact that they are integral to the organization the idea of of doing profiling of every human on earth and finding out who could be a threat to them in the future and killing them is a really good idea. I mean, they're not actually going for world power. They're going to consolidate the power they already have. And I think that's a genius master that's, evil plan. Yeah, that's that's not bad. But you first need to get past the fact that they were they were somehow inside S.H.I.E.L.D. the whole time, which I just I just cannot get over Well, that. they've been there since the inception, so I think that's, it makes perfect sense that they were inside S.H.I.E.L.D. the whole time. Doesn't work. They've, there's never been a S.H.I.E.L.D. without HYDRA. Yeah. That's I just good. can't I, I just I don't buy it because we're meant to believe that this is the most the, the, the smartest but intelligence agency. It's always agencies. had Hydra there. It's never known because Hydra's always been there. It's not like Hydra came in so after the all after of the company had already just found conveniently it. discovered that they're there. Began all this timing like it just happened to converge so that Captain America could fight them with. And it's just stupid. It's all stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll bring up one more issue I have with it <laughs> before I... You know, I don't want to completely agree with you, but um, there is a moment where uh, Robert Redford's character, he reveals his ace up the sleeve. He's actually got the power to take out the um, the United Nations Security Council and he has a gun to his head. You know, Black Widow reveals herself. But he's got something in his pocket that he can just press and he could kill everyone else in the room and then hold Black Widow hostage, right? That's what he does. But he actually waits until after Black Widow has dumped all the secret security files, like a WikiLeaks thing, onto the internet. So oh, he, yeah. he watches his whole plan go up in smoke mm. and then he reveals that he, he's got control. Yeah. That didn't make any sense. Is why, yeah, what's he doing? That was very dumb because he yeah. could have just averted that crisis and saved Hydra, but he just watched Hydra be destroyed publicly revealed to the world yeah and then he did the thing that that was that's weird what stupid. was up with that i'll tell you something else that's stupid tell us as if we're meant to believe that nick fury is actually dead and yeah. let's let's ignore the <laughs> fact that samuel l jackson has signed like a 60 film contract no, with Marvel. I was thinking when it happened i was like oh they're really gonna pretend that he's dead so oh, yeah okay. so is he gonna fulfill the rest of his contract just in flashbacks <laughs> But then, but yeah. but then you you think about it, and you say this is not it's far too bold a move to make with a big character. Un unfortunately, that's what Marvel is bound to. We know that they're going to try and continue this as long as they can. So every single big major character, if they're not a villain, is safe, is absolutely safe. So the fact that we're meant to buy that Nick Fury is dead is just yeah. cheap, and I th I think it speaks. It, it it speaks volumes to the amount that the filmmakers would think that we're gullible enough to actually believe in that happening. Sure. It's a cheap emotional ploy but and it doesn't work. Someone that's not involved in uh, the, the movies as much as we are as, as regards to behind the scenes news and stuff like that. Like, for instance, the guys that were surprised that Bucky was the Winter Soldier... They might not know that Samuel Jackson signed on for several more Marvel films. Yeah, that, that's fine. You need, but yeah, and that's, so that's, beyond... that's, the, that's the majority of the audience, you'd imagine, are people that just go to see these films, not even realising that it's a different studio behind this, it's behind Spider-Man. They just go to sure, see superhero sure. films and just have fun. And Yeah, I, yeah. so that is nerd knowledge that yeah. you would expect him to live. But just in the... It, it's so firmly planted in the world that we live in with action movies where the good guys just don't die. 
So yeah, but- when he comes back, it's just it was shit. When they revealed that he's actually alive, I just thought, yeah, of course he's fucking alive. Yeah. And there's a lot of shit. And then it, and if you don't know anything about the Marvel universe, when he comes back, and if you're genuinely surprised that he's alive, then maybe you've only seen three or four movies in your lifetime. <laughs> Fantastic, great for you. Crap, it was just crap. Okay, okay, just- yes. I mean, I was expecting it, but I didn't have a problem with it. I guess I just thought, well, yes, he need to fake his. Excuse me. He need to fake his own death at this point because he needs to get the information, which has been done in other films for the same reason, and yeah. it's fine. Like it's 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 a great position to be in if your enemies think you're dead. So I was cool with that. Maybe the only way they could have made it work is if we were aware, along with his, uh, along with him, that that he was dead. Like if we were in on the plot, then maybe that would have worked. But yeah, it, did, okay. it 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 trying to do the rug pull in the audience. Um, Toby Jones is. Um, Basil exposition scene was was pretty hilarious. You know, I actually really liked that <laughs> yeah. whole stupid and and see, this is why I object to. Um, I don't think that you could say that I am not giving it its fair due as a stupid action movie. Mm-hmm. I like the idea that one of the old villains is now alive in a computer <laughs> underground, in several ancient computer banks. Yeah, that yeah. are somehow run on tapes. Doesn't make any fucking sense at all. <laughs> yeah. But it looked great. No, but it gets it gets powered by a USB stick. Dave. <laughs> That's right. So yeah, yeah, and not only just a USB stick, but there was like a hub, yeah. and you plug it in on top of the hub. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you get extra USB power. But uh, I you liked- just buy one of those adapters that plugs your USB thing into ancient 1940s technology. Yeah. You know the yeah. ones you get? Get them at like Radio Shack or exactly. on eBay or yeah. something. Yeah, They're really yeah. useful. It's pretty easy to get. Yeah. yeah. And they got fast shipping over there. So that's how they knew to have them. I didn't, I didn't know they were there. I threw out my 1940s computer banks just the other week before I realized that there was a, a thing. It <laughs> was a yeah. rookie mistake. Yeah, I know. And I bet you threw out all those old reels of tape as <laughs> yeah. well that make computers run. Yeah. 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 See, yeah. So that, that is dumb. That is dumb dumb as you get but mm. I, I thought that, that was a really enjoyable fun idea so it was I a very it was very that. throwbacky to the, to the first film yeah, yeah it was a kind of it was a nice notion um, I know you had problems with the Falcon being so conveniently the Falcon but what did you think about Anthony Mackie and him just being bros and hanging out because I really liked their relationship I thought that was really well done yeah that was nice I love yeah. the opening scene where he's running around the, the, <laughs> the Clinton monument or whatever it is that's nice and that's and what again. Steve Rogers needs is he needs buddies he's at his best when yep. he's when he's, he's got um, someone to bounce off, I guess. That's yeah. right, yeah, because he isn't really an action... I mean, he is an action hero, but he's his best when he's his normal self. He's a rare example of a character that's more interesting as his normal self mm. than when he's in full flight mode. Yeah. So, yeah, it was really nice to have that rapport between them. All right, I guess that's all the super detailed uh, script stuff I wanted to talk about. There are some other things, but uh, I'm aware that we've been running quite late. So, And it is late on a weeknight, and I need to get up at this stupid o'clock in the morning. Yes. And you just yes. look tired, man. You oh, you've had enough. My, my, my <laughs> cheek's swelling up on this one side. Oh, yeah, I forgot about your toothache. You've done really well. So yeah. you're in horrible pain? It's excruciating. <laughs> There's, uh, yeah, I've made it through. I made it through fine. I'm pretty sure that tomorrow morning I'm going to be told I need all my wisdom teeth out. So, yeah, with any luck, I can get that done really quickly, and uh, I'll be right for next Friday. Uh, all right, thanks for listening, guys. It's been fun, and we will catch you next week for some Grand Budapest action. See you then. I'm finished. <laughs>